wilderness mentalities. What happens to you if you have a wrong mindset? What happens to you if you have a wrong attitude? I'm sure most of you here have a perfect attitude, but in case there's just a few people who don't, I'll just go ahead and chat with you for just a little bit. Amen? God has a great life planned for each and every one of us, no one excluded. He's promised us many things in the Word, and He wants us to have every single one of them. Each one of the promises of God are for every single person. Some people seem to live in those promises, and some people just never quite seem to make it. Why? Well, I think we find a very good example with the Israelites. They were in bondage in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. And I believe that that's more or less equivalent to living a life of sin without God. Although they did know of God and they were praying for God to get them out, there's still a good parallel here. God brought them out of Egypt to take them into the promised land. He brought them out to take them in. But they had to travel through a place called the wilderness. And it was an 11 day journey. The Bible says it was an 11 day journey from Egypt to the border of the promised land. But it took them 40 years to make this 11 day journey. Now we all have a journey with God. How many of you have realized that you have quite a journey with God? We call it our walk with God. We call it a lot of things. but. Every year that's added to my life now, I think more and more about my journey in life and my journey with God. And um, I guess I'd just like you to ask yourself where you're at on your journey. Are you living in the promised land? Or are you still wandering around somewhere out in the wilderness? And if so, you need to be very careful about doing what the Israelites did, which was they always blamed their lack of progress on their enemies. Now, I want to say it again. They always blamed their lack of progress on their enemies. It's the devil's fault. It's because of the way I was raised. It's because I didn't have the same opportunities that other people had. You just don't understand. It's because, because, because. And it's always, it's always somebody else's responsibility other than our own. And many years ago, God revealed to me, I mean, probably 20 years ago, God revealed to me that it wasn't their enemies. They called them the Ites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and on and on. It was their attitude, plain and simple. Attitude comes from thoughts, and from our thoughts also come our words. And if you've done any study in the Word of God, hopefully you have some even little idea at this point in your life how very important and powerful your own words are. The Word of God coming out of a faith-filled mouth is a tremendously powerful weapon against Satan. That is the only way that you can really defeat him is by learning the Word, living the Word, speaking the Word, believing the Word. But it all comes from your thoughts. So you have to begin to take an account of your thoughts, begin to think about what you're thinking about and realize that you can think whatever you want to, you just have to make good choices. The first wilderness mentality we saw that kept them in the wilderness was that they just didn't have a positive vision for their future. They just had a bad attitude, a negative attitude. They, you know, everything for them was based on their past. And God wanted them to have hope and to have a dream, and to have a vision for their life. Now, the second wilderness mentality that we see them have is an attitude that kind of said this. I mean, nobody would actually go and say this to somebody, but our attitude can say it for us, and this is it. Somebody do everything for me, I don't want to take the responsibility. Well, they... They need to do something about taxes. They need to do something about the way things are in America. They need to make some changes at this church. 
they need to make some changes at my job. And you know, several years ago, I got to thinking, who are they? <laughs> this elusive group called they. <laughs> Because they are supposed to fix everything. <laughs> But when I really thought about it realistically, I didn't know who they were. And then I realized that we are they. Well, that went over big. <laughs> Listen, if you've got one lazy bone in your body, you might as well get over it right now. Because if you need a holy kick in your royal rump, I'm here to give it to you today. <laughs> Amen? So the quicker you... <laughs> Dave's down here going... <laughs> The quicker you cooperate with me and get into agreement with this and make some decisions about changing some things in your life, the better it's going to be for all of us. And I will be able to get through all three points today if you will get them a little more quickly. So, we are they. They is not somebody else that's supposed to fix everything in our lives. If you have a bad marriage, did it ever occur to you to do something? Well, it's not my fault, it's their fault. Well, why don't you start by sowing good seed? Do your part, you do what's right, no matter what the other person does, now you're giving God something to work with. Yeah. Amen? We always want somebody else to do something. Their attitude basically said, I don't want to do it, you do it. Somebody else do it. I want to have a nice life, but I don't want to do anything to get that nice life. That's what passivity is. Passivity wants something good to happen, and they're going to sit and wait to see if it does. We need to be responsible. And responsibility is not very popular in our society today. So many of the problems that we have today, so many of the moral problems that we have today, strictly go back to a root of somebody doesn't want to take responsibility and God never made us to not be responsible responsibility simply means to respond to the ability that God has placed in you to take care of issues in your life or things that concern you you have ability God has given you ability responsibility means to respond to the opportunity the opportunity that is put in front of you. I always like to mention Abraham and how God came to him. He found a man that he could make a covenant with and through that covenant bring blessings to all of his people for generations to come. And he told him, you've got to leave this place and go to a place that I will show you. He had to get up and get out of the mess he was in and make a little progress. But you know, Abraham was not the first man, he was called Abram then, he was not the first man that God offered this opportunity to. I wonder how many, I wonder how many people God has to go through these days to get somebody to do what he wants them to do. That's why I always say, Even when we receive offerings or I talk to people on TV about giving, it's an opportunity and I believe that wholeheartedly. I don't think you have to do it to be saved. I don't, you know, you, but it's an opportunity. I do believe that people miss a lot of blessings in life if they never learn how to give. Because the Bible says you will reap what you sow. But it's still an opportunity and if God can't get you to do it, he will find somebody. But I don't want to get passed over 200 times in my life and see somebody else end up with a blessing that was supposed to be for me because I was too stinking lazy to take my responsibility. Many are called, few are chosen. It's a great scripture. What in the world does that mean? I heard one person say that many people are called but not very many want to take the responsibility for the call. You can't have great things without work and effort and 
sacrifice and doing the part that God gives you to do. And the Israelites, bless their darling little hearts, they just got out there and just grumbled and murmured and moaned and everything was Moses and God and, you know, nothing was ever, ever them. Abram was not the first man to be offered this opportunity. His, his father was actually offered the opportunity first. And I'd like us to put up Genesis 11:31 on the overhead, please. And Terah took Abram, his son, Lot, took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together to go from Ur the Chaldees into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, well, let's just back up a few words, but, <laughs> but, boy, that, that word is such a huge problem. Well, I know I shouldn't say this, but, well, I know I shouldn't act like this, but, well, I know that I don't need to eat this, but, well, I know I really shouldn't spend this money, but, well, I know I should forgive, but. I hope you don't take this as being too stern, but I don't know how much help there is for somebody like that. If you know what's right and don't do it, or if I know what's right and don't do it, then it kind of puts it back in my ballpark, doesn't it? And to be honest, sometimes I can even tell by the way crowds respond how desperate we are for this kind of teaching. I always tell people, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a dessert ministry. <laughs> if you came for dessert, you'll have to catch the next person that comes through town because I'm more the spinach and carrots and zucchini and squash and meat, 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 meat. But, come on, let's put it back up there. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Oh, how I hate that. When somebody knows what God's calling them to and they start out but, 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 they settle somewhere along the way for something that's way less than what God had intended for them. And I just want you to ask yourself today, if once you had a vision, and once you had a dream, and once you were on fire, and passionate, and full of zeal, and you had a determination, but you've settled somewhere. I mean, you're not really happy, but you're kind of okay, happy, you can make it every day. You don't really have a real, real, not, not a really every day godly attitude, but, you know, you can act kind of nice on Sunday. <laughs> Come on. Don't put up with that stuff out of yourself. Don't settle. Don't settle for less than God's best for you. I, I'm, not, I'm not the type that settles. Actually, I felt like God spoke something to my heart the other morning. This just came to me when I was, you know, we've always got stuff, you know, people coming against you and this and that and something else. And, and uh, I just, just came up in me, you got to be a pit bull in the spirit. <laughs> now, we don't want to come across like that to people. We don't want to bark and growl at people. But when it comes to the devil, you better be a pit bull. You better be like, I am going to take hold of what is mine through Christ, and I am not going to let it go. And devil, when you growl at me, I'm going to growl back. He settled. Oh, that's so sad. He settled. Well, then, a few years later, after they lived there for a while, then God tried again, and he asked Terah's son, Abram, come out 
Well, see, one of the reasons why God had to separate Abram from his family was because you could already see the attitude of the people he was living with. You know, you can't just hang out with a bunch of lazy, whiny, wimpy. I mean, I got enough trouble with the devil. I don't need people trying to bring me down. I want some people in my life that make me happy. Do what you can do. Even if you think what you can do is not enough. Do what you can do. And God will do what you cannot do. I don't know why God always wants us involved, but it has something to do with this partnership thing with God. I was thinking this morning about when Moses came to the Red Sea and he had all the, the Israelites there and the Egyptian army was chasing them and the Red Sea was in front of them. And God was getting ready to part the Red Sea. But he told Moses, stretch out your rod. Now, we all know that God could have parted the Red Sea without the whole rod stretching thing and that it really had nothing to do with it except it was a symbol, an act of faith. An act of faith. Now, I would imagine that Moses probably in reality felt a bit stupid. <laughs> but he did what he could do. And God did what he could not do. I like to think about the man with the withered or the crippled arm. And, you know, that literally meant that he couldn't move his arm. It was withered and drawn up and he had no movement in it. It was just like frozen in place. Now, Jesus seems to delight in telling people to do things they can't do. He says to him, stretch out your arm. <laughs> uh, excuse me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's why I'm here, because I can't stretch out my arm. And I, I hope that you can get what I'm going to say, but there was something in that man that responded in faith. And even though he didn't know that he could do what Christ asked him to do. I believe that something in him gathered up and he at least went. And the moment that he did what he could do. Whoa, Jesus did the part he couldn't do. And I tell you, there's many times in my life when I think, you know, that's all I can do is just this one little I started working out about three and a half years ago, and it's been quite a journey for me because I didn't start till I was 64, and that's, you know, a little unusual. But, <laughs> and it wasn't that God wasn't dealing with me about it for years. I just plain didn't want to do it, so I made 99 excuses all the time. And finally, I just knew that I had to, if I wanted to be strong for the last part of my journey and be able to do what God wanted me to do, I needed to do that. And so... Um, in the process, I've hurt myself a few times because I'm pretty aggressive and, and I not only have the exercises they give me, I have what they call Joyce exercises, <laughs> which means when I'm out of town or off somewhere, I'll just do, I'll make up stuff <laughs> and do it. <laughs> and then I hurt myself. And so, you know, on and on and on. Anyway. In the process, I've heard a few things, and I just got over a really bad back injury, which wasn't all from, from working out. It was 30 years of walking on these hard platforms and high heels and a lot of other silly stuff, which that's another story for another day. But you may notice I've changed my shoes, and I have a nice chair here with me now. So I don't think we'll get any sense at all until we're about 50, and then... This took me a little longer than, than 50. But um, last week I was in the gym and my back had just gotten well, my shoulder was well, my elbow was okay, my wrists were okay. And 
I just went to do a simple exercise that I normally do. And my quad muscle went. <laughs> I couldn't finish. And I said to my coach, I said, let me tell you something. I will be in this gym to work out if all I can move is my little finger. <laughs> and see, really, I didn't say that for her. I said it for the devil. <laughs> to let him know that I was a pit bull in the spirit and I am not going to give up. Amen? Amen. Now, you know, there's a blind man Blind meaning he couldn't see anything. And he cried out for healing, and Jesus told him to, well, you know, first he spit on the ground, strange thing, made mud, stranger still, rubbed it on the guy, really, really weird. <laughs> and said, now, go and wash over there in that pool. Excuse me, Jesus, I can't see. I can't see the pool. I'm liable to fall off the cliff trying to get there. <laughs> see, some of the things that Jesus has people do are just so like, don't you get it, Jesus? But I don't, you know, the guy must have just, I don't know. Then maybe something supernatural happened on the inside of him and he got some, you know, direction about where the pool was. but. He came back seeing, that's all I know. <laughs> Amen? When God gave Joshua the job of taking over where Moses had left off after Moses died, they, were, they spent 30 days mourning Moses, which was the law then. They were given 30 days to mourn their loss and then God required them to go on. I know that may sound a little bit harsh, but I think there's a principle here that we don't want to miss, that there's a time for mourning, but then there's a time when you have to go on, you know? You, you can't spend your whole life sad over something that you can't do anything about anymore. You need time for emotions to heal and all those things, but Loss just seems to be part of the journey. You know, you lose a job, you lose a friend. You know, I mean, there's things you lose. You lose things, you, whatever. You lose your reputation. <laughs> there's a lot of things that you can lose. Well, they had lost their leader. They'd lost Moses, and they all depended on Moses. And so now God was getting ready to give Joshua the job, and the first thing he said to him was, Arise. And we see that word in the Bible a lot, and the word simply means get up and get going. Arise and lead these people into the land that flows with milk and honey. He was giving him a new responsibility. Joshua was going to have a new privilege to be the one to lead them into the promised land, but he also was getting a lot of responsibility. Please make the connection today. Connect the dots. And not just people in here, but people watching by TV. Everything you want, every promotion you want in life, everything in your life that you want to get better, you can't just sit and wish and just pray and hope and think they need to do something. You need to pray, God, I want this to change. You show me if there's something you want me to do. And if so, give me the grace to do it. And all the while, I'm going to be trusting you, trusting you, trusting you, trusting you. I don't want to get in works of the flesh trying to make something happen. But you have to do your part. Well, we definitely want to get rid of all wilderness mentalities. Start taking responsibility, knowing that we are anointed for hard things. You know, Mom just had a vision years ago to um, 
really just, she just thought about people, you know, hurting and not being able to get, you know, care for that. And so she, we just basically started looking around, how can we start helping people? And so we started with hospitals and, you know, we just go, um, you know, five, six times a year to different countries and um, just try to help as many people as we can, try to go to the poorest, most unreached places that we can find, places that really do not have access to medical care, and um, just help people. Door ontzendingswerk Hand of Hope ervaren we hoe levens veranderen en harten open gaan. Uw bijdrage, groot of klein, maakt veel uit in het leven van een mens. Hij krijgt daardoor een warme maaltijd, medische verzorging of hoort voor het eerst over Jezus. Help mee om Gods liefde aan zoveel mogelijk mensen door te geven. You know, I don't think that we can underestimate the power of habits in our lives. First, we form habits, and eventually they form us. In my new book, Making Good Habits, Breaking Bad Habits, you'll discover that the freedom from bad habits lies in filling your life with one good habit after another. And with God's help, I believe you can put an end to struggling with bad habits and discover a new level of success in your life. Get my new book today. In dit boek vertelt Joyce hoe het aanleren van goede gewoonten je leven kan verbeteren. Nu ook verkrijgbaar op DVD. En profiteer van de zetkorting via onze website joyce-meijer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Joyce Meijer is toch van tv? Wat doet ze nog meer? Ze schrijft boeken. Ik hou niet zo van lezen. Er zijn ook dvd's. En wat nog meer? Themaboekjes, mokken. Hé, hey, dat kan ik allemaal niet onthouden. Daarom is er de Joyce Meyer Info en Productbroschure. Met een overzicht van alle boeken en dvd's. Had dat dan meteen gezegd? Die kan je online bekijken of bestellen. Kosteloos. Met alle informatie over de dagelijkse overdenkingen, Facebook, nieuwsbrief... Niet slecht. Bestel nu ook de Joyce Meyer info- en productbrochure via joyce-meyer.nl slash brochure of telefonisch via 026 2022 100. Super.